In this case, the mainstream press hasn't failed. They've mentioned the fact that Rahm Emanuel is a principal node in the Israel lobby uh, campaign contribution network, that he wasn't necessarily really behind Obama until he switched sides in June uh, away from Hillary Clinton, probably because it looked like she wasn't going to be viable, and then introduced uh, Obama to the power elite of APAC at their annual conference. And ever since then, uh, and this is why I say it's a remarkable mirror of the Kennedy administration, of course, he's been named chief of staff. Uh, we know all about his father's illustrious past. As a, the press calls it gun running. I would call it, <laughs> I would call it something different with the Ergun and his own participation in Israel's war efforts uh, back in the 91 Gulf War, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what people don't understand is the following. Obama's made some pretty implicit promises about winding down the confrontational approach to the Middle East, as well as getting troops out of Iran. But yet he's appointed Rahm Emanuel as his chief of staff. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. Today, though, I'm looking ahead to my second term. And I'm very proud to announce my choice for America's next Secretary of State, John Kerry. In a sense, John's entire life has prepared him for this role. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> So amidst all these reports of, of phony, bogus stuff going on, how could you concede the election on the day? How could you concede the 2004 election on the day? When, in this book, it said there were 5 million votes that were suppressed and you won the election. Didn't you want to be president? I'm, I'm not even done yet. I have two more questions. If you were so against Iran, how come you were not saying, let's impeach Bush now? Impeach Bush now before we can invade Iran. Why don't we impeach him? Impeach Bush. Clinton, Clinton was impeached for what? A blowjob? Why don't we impeach Bush, all right? Also, are you a member of, were you a member of Skull and Bones and Collins and Bush? Are you in the same <laughs> secret society? Okay. So I'm sorry, let me answer this question. So, Joe, for your faith in your fellow Americans, for your love of country, and for your lifetime of service that will endure through the generations, uh, I'd like to ask the military aide to join us on stage. For the final time as president, I am pleased to award our nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And I, I don't remember what I said to my on-air partner, Pat. We were talking about it, and I said, you know what? How fast did the Patriot Act? How did they write that? How many pages was that? I never even thought, you know, this is in the innocent days. Who wrote the Patriot Act? Because we know who wrote the Stimulus uh, uh, Act, and that was the Apollo Alliance. We looked it up. Does anybody here in the audience know who wrote the Patriot Act or when it was written? This will blow your mind. It was written in 1995. 1995, including the wiretapping and everything else. America, you know who wrote it? One of the biggest union guys of them all, Joe Biden. But in a nutshell, Joe Biden uh, in 1995 wrote this uh, legislation which basically is, in a nutshell, the Patriot Act. They reworded it, they rearranged some of the paragraphs, but it's pretty much almost verbatim uh, the language that is in the Patriot Act. And so it existed some seven years before 9-11. Here's the thing, Hillary Clinton, she's been a first lady. She's been a senator. She's been my secretary of state. She's been in the room when tough decisions were made. She knows how those decisions can affect a veteran or a soldier or a kid who needs a great education or a worker who's fighting for a good job or a raise or a decent retirement. And 
I will tell you, even in the middle of crisis, she is calm and cool and collected. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed radio. Yes, we came, we saw, he died. <laughs> This record of crime, deceit, and aggression is enough to make all but the most psychopathic recoil in disgust. But none of Obama's shameful actions as commander-in-chief should be remotely surprising to those who were willing to look beyond the hype and look squarely at the facts. His supporters on the left imagined him to be an answer to the outrageous criminality of the banksters on Wall Street, even as those very same banksters were his top campaign contributors. He even took time out of his 2008 campaign to show his complete support for the disastrous banker bailout that was sneaking its way through Congress. As Republican John McCain and his Democratic rival Barack Obama head to Washington to help broker a deal on a Wall Street rescue plan, McCain, speaking in New York at the Clinton Global Initiative, said a deal must be achieved by the time financial markets open on Monday. The debate that matters most right now is taking place in the United States Capitol. And I intend to join it. Senator Obama is doing the same. America should be proud of the bipartisanship with that we're seeing. Speaking to the same group by satellite from Florida, Barack Obama agreed with McCain that the $700 billion bailout for the troubled financial industry needs some modifications. But alluding to the White House meeting taking place later in the afternoon, Obama said now is not the time for partisanship. This goes beyond uh, traditional election time politics. Now is the time to come together, Democrats and Republicans, in a spirit of cooperation on behalf of the American people. On this vote, the yeas are 263, the nays are 171. The motion is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. But while there's plenty of blame to go around, and many in Washington and Wall Street who deserve it, all of us, all of us, have a responsibility to solve this crisis because it affects the financial well-being of every single American. There will be time to punish those who set this fire, but now's not the time to argue about how it got set or did the neighbor sleep in his bed or leave the stove on. Right now we want to put out that fire. And now's the time for us to come together and do that. And then his supporters acted surprised when his administration failed to prosecute anyone at all for the largest swindle in the history of the planet. So far in civil proceedings, the government has levied several billion dollars in penalties for misconduct in a crisis that's cost investors and homeowners many hundreds of billions of dollars. But to date, not one senior Wall Street executive has been held criminally liable by the Department of Justice for activities related to the financial crisis. So Eric Holder uh, went in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday and they asked him about that. The same Eric Holder who earlier was saying, yeah, I could drop a drone on you if you're a regular citizen. I don't need a trial, stinking trials, I don't need them, right? I can just execute you. But when it comes to the bankers, this is what he said instead. I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to um, to prosecute them when we are hit with um, indications that if you do prosecute, if you do bring a criminal charge, uh, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. And I think that is a function of the fact that some of these institutions have become too large. Amazing. In actual Senate testimony, he says, well, yeah, okay, they're too large, but what can we do? So it'll hurt the global economy, so we're not going to do our job. Get out of jail, free card. Here you go. Use it anytime you like. Not only did we not prosecute you for past crimes, we're telling you right here in public, we're not going to prosecute you for future crimes. Have at it, Hoss. But just in case there was any doubt as to who put Obama in power, and whose interests he was working for, the Podesta email leak confirmed that not just Attorney General Holder, but almost the entirety of Obama's cabinet was hand-selected for him by Citigroup. 
So this particular WikiLeaks email is from a month before Obama first became president. And it's between John Podesta, who was then head of Obama's transition team for president, and Michael Froman, who was at the time an executive at Citigroup, Citibank's parent company. Froman emailed Podesta a list of people who would be good choices for Obama's cabinet. Keep in mind, this is a month before he won the election. As writer David Dayen put it, the cabinet list ended up being almost entirely on the money. It correctly identified Eric Holder for the Justice Department, Janet Napolitano for Homeland Security, Robert Gates for Defense, Rahm Emanuel for Chief of Staff, Peter Orzog for the Office of Management and Budget, Arnie Duncan for... All right, let's skip ahead. No one gives a shit about Arnie Duncan. <laughs> Arnie Duncan doesn't care about Arnie Duncan. <laughs> for the Treasury, three possibilities were on the list. Robert Rubin, Larry Summers, and Timothy Geithner. Tim Geithner ended up being Treasury Secretary, and the other two played prominent roles. So think about that. An executive at Citibank's parent company, one of the most powerful banks in the world, gave Obama nearly his entire cabinet, including his economic team, immediately following the 2008 collapse caused by the greed of the big banks. Obama then went on to let Wall Street entirely off the hook for destroying the lives of millions of Americans. Or to put that in a more polite way, Geithner and friends dictated the Obama administration's light touch policy <laughs> on bank misconduct, which resulted in no serious legal or fiduciary consequences for the major players. Do you see what this leaked email says? The big banks literally decide who runs our economy and our country at least a month before the election even happens. Why should it come as any surprise at all, then, to learn that Obama's signal accomplishment during his time in office, Obamacare, was written by the insurance companies themselves? And I want to single out one person. And that one person is sitting next to me. Her name is Liz Fowler. Liz Fowler is ch our, my chief health counsel. Liz Fowler has put my team together, the health, health care team. Liz Fowler worked for me many years ago, since left the private sector, and then came back when she realized that, that she could be there in the creation of health care reform, because she wanted to, in a certain sense, that to be her, her professional lifetime goal. She put together that, uh, the white paper last November 2008, 87-page um, document, which became the basis, the foundation, the blueprint from which almost all health care measures in all bills, both sides of the aisle I came from. She's an amazing person, she's a lawyer, she's a PhD, she's just so decent, she's always smiling, she's always working, so she's always available to help any center, any staff, and I just, I thank Liz at the bottom of my heart, and in many ways she typifies, she represents um, all of the people who've worked so hard to make this bill such a, an accomplishment. So what, you're thinking? So who is this Liz Fowler anyway, and why is it so important to be bringing up this, well, gr gushing and rather embarrassing praise from Senator Baucus on the House floor? Well, it's because Liz Fowler is not just someone who was formerly in private industry, as he tangentially ma made mention of in that speech, but someone who, well, had a very interesting uh, history, and one that we can even pick up from mainstream sources like NBCNews.com, which had a post back a few years ago, Fact or Fiction? Senate Chairman Has Ties to Big Insurer. Quote, Elizabeth Fowler, now, served, now serving as counsel to Baucus on the Finance Committee, worked as an executive, not a lobbyist, for WellPoint, the largest publicly traded commercial health benefits company from 2006 to 2008. Prior to that, she'd worked for Baucus. Committee spokesman, spokeswoman Erin Shields called Fowler one of the brightest healthcare minds in the Senate, and she and the Finance Committee staff have been working day and night to reach the goal of reform that lowers costs and ensures quality affordable healthcare coverage, which is Baucus's priority. Shields added that the only factor that influences his decisions and the decisions of his staff is whether a policy is right for his state and for the American people. According to Senate records, Michelle Easton, former chief health counsel to the Finance Committee under Baucus, is lobbying for WellPoint for her firm, Tarplin Downs & Young. End quote. 
Well, of course, that that um, MSM uh, post obviously downplays the important aspects of this. The fact that Liz Fowler, the person who Baucus was gushing about and who was absolutely essential in bringing the Affordable Care Act to the American public, was not just a lobbyist for the world uh, for America and the world's largest publicly traded health benefits company but was in fact an executive for them. And if we wanted to be even more specific, which oddly NBCNews.com decided not to be, she was a former vice president of WellPoint. So here we have someone in the very heart of the private insurance world coming in to write the very Affordable Care Act, which is supposed to provide all of this wonderful manna from heaven free health care to the public. Except for the fact that it's going to cost the average American much, much, much more to get insured under this new regime. John Kerry said, no, 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 we're going to tax your health insurance. We're going to tax those evil insurance companies. We're going to impose a tax that if they sell health insurance, it's too expensive. We're going to tax them. And conveniently, the tax rate will happen to be the marginal tax rate under the income tax code. So basically, it's the same thing. We just tax the insurance companies. They pass it on higher prices. That offsets the tax break we get. It ends up being the same thing. It's a very clever, you know, basically exploitation of the, of the, of the lack of economic understanding of the American voter. And why should it be a surprise that the military-industrial complex has benefited from yet another Obama accomplishment? A report released recently by the Center for International Policy found that the Obama administration has shattered existing records when it comes to international weapon sales. The report outlines how in President Obama's first five years in office, new agreements under the Pentagon's Foreign Military Sales Program, the largest channel for U.S. arms exported, totaled over $169 billion. So even after adjusting that for inflation, that number pales in comparison to the only $30 billion in deals cut by the Bush administration in its entire two terms in office, meaning that the Obama administration officially bears the honor of having approved more weapon sales than any other since World War II. As U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice said the proposed military aid package to Israel is larger than any the United States has ever offered to any country. Under the headline, America's $40 billion aid package to Israel is largest ever. The 10-year aid program would give Israel up to $40 billion to upgrade its military aircraft and missile defense systems to defend against rocks, I mean militants in Lebanon and the Gaza Strip and Al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates in Syria and Egypt. The Saudis, an arms deal with them worth $1.29 billion has been approved. The United States has approved a $1.2 billion deal to replenish the Saudi Air Force's arsenal depleted by its controversial bombing campaign against rebels in Yemen. Congress has 30 days to block the sale but is unlikely to do so and shipment of more than 19,000 smart bombs is urgent with strikes continuing daily. The simple fact is that the real power in the American oligarchy isn't wielded by the president. Obama was just a smiling, affable teleprompter reader for the powers behind the throne, the deep state. And thanks to NSA whistleblower Russell Tice, we now know that Obama himself was wiretapped and presumably blackmailed, not by the Russian government, but by the NSA itself. And by the way, with respect to my concerns about uh, privacy issues, I will leave this office at some point, sometime in the last next three and a half years. And uh, after that, I will be a private citizen. And I suspect that, uh, you know, on, on a list of people who might be targeted, uh, you know, so that uh, somebody could read their emails or, or listen to their phone calls, I'd probably be pretty high on that list. So it's not as if I don't have a personal interest in making sure my privacy is protected. Last week, NSA whistleblower Russell Tice conducted interviews on Boiling Frog's Post and The Corbett Report, where he revealed shocking new details of the NSA spying scandal. In addition to detailing how the NSA is collecting and storing the content of all electronic communications passing through the United States, he also revealed for the first time some of the specific targets of past NSA wiretapping operations, including senior congressional leaders, the former White House press secretary, high-ranking military generals, the entire Supreme Court, and even then-senator from Illinois and future president, Barack Obama. Yeah, it was, it was uh, journalists 
it were it was um, members of Congress, uh, both houses, Senate and uh, in the House, um, especially on the intelligence committees, in the armed services committees, and on judiciary committees, um, and and as well as the senior leadership in both the House and the Senate. It was judges, um, federal judges, and um, it, it, every member of the Supreme Court, all nine of which I held. The, the initial um, uh, targeting of Judge Alito in my hand when they when Judge Alito was being put up for um, you know his position on the Supreme Court so I saw I saw the Alito paperwork in my hand uh, physically um, it was um, it was members of uh, of a, a few members of, of Bush's own staff um, in in the White House. Uh, who else did they? They went after uh, lots of lawyers and law firms, I noticed. In your um, interview on Boiling Frog's Post, you, you mentioned specifically uh, General Petraeus? Yes, they they went after senior uh, military leaders. Um, with my satellite stuff, I saw... I saw how they went after... They went after um, the State Department. They went after Colin Powell, Secretary of State. They went after General Sasaki. Uh, and then on the terrestrial side, I saw the paperwork as they were going after um, General Petraeus. Was Barack Obama targeted by this? Uh, yes, he was. As a matter of fact, that was in 2004, probably now, well, late summer time frame. Um, and he was he was a candidate for senator. He'd already won his primary in Illinois. And that's when I saw um, you know, Barack Obama's name. In the end, Obama's personal failings and foibles are secondary to his main attribute, his willingness to enact the agenda of those who pulled his strings. It is ever so. But the real question is, what have people learned from the disaster of the Obama years? Do they understand the true nature of deep state power? The true continuity of agenda that takes place even as the pendulum swings from left to right? Or... Are they simply going to fall for the same trick again and again until the final nail is placed in the coffin of human freedom? Well, I've come out of the Bush era where uh, he assigned the law of the U.S. Patriot Act, Bush, which allowed the government to listen on your phone calls, download your emails, come in your home while you're not there and snoop in your home and leave and all kinds of egregious things, which I oppose vocally. So when Obama came around and I thought, wow, this can be a new era. I mean, and he actually talked about limiting government power and stopping war and all those things. So I said, hey, maybe this is the chance we need. He got the Nobel Peace Prize, but he was the first president actually to conduct eight years of war, believe it or not. Last year alone, he dropped 26,000 bombs in the Middle East. Now, this is a guy that early on, some of the, and again, it depends on uh, the early analysts from the left wings uh, who dealt with uh, what they call the military industrial complex were saying, hey, he's working with the military industrial complex. We're really surprised. So what I would say is a lot of times with candidates, you have to wait and see what they do before you heap all this praise on them because it builds an expectation, and then people buy into a myth. I mean, people are still talking about greatest president ever, but when I look at his record, uh, under the most recent act, that he's uh, National Defense Authorization Act that he re-upped, he had an anti-propagation, a propaganda center now. They're going to be watching what we say, what we do if we're so-called uh, – going against the interest of America. Well, anybody out there is a peace activist that's against war and stuff like that is going to be watched even closer now. Uh, and he just, his Justice Department, just a few days ago, uh, under Obama, signed a provision allowing the NSA now to share all our information with 16 federal agencies. That's amazing. Remember, it was Edward Snowden. It wasn't Bush that he was opposing, NSA, Bush's NSA. It was Obama's NSA. So if you add up, at the end of the day, all the things that we see happening, the militarized police grew exponentially under Obama. All this military equipment flowing to local police in this country, tanks. So this all happened under Obama. It all built up under Obama. But I'll say this, Bush started the ball rolling. Obama pushed it faster and bigger. And now we got Donald Trump. I mean... 
he hasn't stepped into the presidency yet, but do I think he's going to pull back on this power that he has now? Sending Obama sending troops into Poland <laughs> as the final act of his presidency without congressional approval. That violates the Constitution. So uh, what we're facing is, I, in my opinion, and I've said it over and over, we're, we're facing a government that's out of control. And uh, it started under Obama. If we really believe in freedom, it's time to step up and act now, America, I'm telling you. So the color card was played very insidiously and effectively by Barack Obama and his handlers whether it was Lockheed Corporation, Goldman Sachs. I mean, it's an endless list that won't be missed, all right? But we have to understand that they have, when I say they, I'm talking about the, the national and global, what I call power elite, that 1% or 1.5%, whatever, all right? They, they, they keep us corralled, if you will, James, on, on a plantation, a plantation, Democrat, Republican plantation, as if that's left and right. It's not. What it is simply is evil. It's a plantation of bloodsuckers. Uh, and I don't care what they call themselves. They're now people talking about, oh, we should have Elizabeth Warren. No, we should not have Elizabeth Warren. No, we should not. We don't need Democrats or Republicans. We need each other. Each other. And how long will it take the people in, in, in this country, in the United States, to understand that what it's about is divide and conquer, play each other off against each other, use each other, manipulate through fear, through disinformation. I repeat, disinformation. And that way, control us. Eight years on from that day of infamy, we are left to sort through the ashes of the Obama administration. They are the ashes of the lives destroyed, the families torn apart, the countries ruined by yet another willing servant of the American imperial project. But if there is any ray of hope, it is that we have here an opportunity to learn a lesson once and for all. Until people stop falling for the lie and refuse to participate in the deep state-approved spectacle of the elections, voting for smiling figureheads on the back of trite toothpaste advertisement slogans like Hope and Change or Make America Great Again, the people of the United States and the people of the world will get exactly what they ask for. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support. And with that, I just have two more words to say. Obama out. <laughs>